Sothorios, land of monsters and mystery. And also, by the way, Westeros, Essos, Sothorios. There's no Nothorios, and I don't know how Olthos fits into that, but yes, we're going to Sothorios, land of monsters and mystery, where nothing is safe or normal. Take the inhabitants for starters. The only normal humanoids, quote unquote, that we'll find here are the most outcast reject pirates that you'll find anywhere in the world. That's right, the Basilisk Isles are basically the place you go when your crimes are too foul for the Iron Islands or the Three Sisters and places like that. And then after that, it's on to a bit of the weird evolution. That's right, because the neighbors of the reject pirates, I mean Corsairs, Corsairs of the Basilisk Isles are some weird fishy looking people that worship a giant oily black stone toad idol. And then on the continent proper, in the jungle, we have the inhuman sounding brindled men who may just be misunderstood or who may just want to eat you. The flora and fauna are no picnic either. I mean, people joke about how everything in Australia can kill you, right? Like this vicious baby kangaroo I'm risking my life to examine here for science. But in Sothorios, everything really does want to kill you. From freaky parasites to a myriad of turn your flesh inside out type of diseases to wyverns and basilisks and what sound like velociraptors. This is basically the fantasy horror version of inhospitable come to life. To make it even more fun, no one has any idea how big Sothorios is, although we do know it is huge. It's roughly in the position of Africa or South America on the pretend Song of Ice and Fire globe, which you can call the Planetos or the Girth as you prefer. But only the northern portion of this continent seems to be known to the map makers and chart makers of the Citadel. The rest of it, and indeed the entire southern hemisphere, remains unmapped and unknown, simply because Sothorios itself is so inhospitable and because there doesn't seem to be any other southern land masses that are connected to the known world via trade. In fact, a Valyrian dragonlord supposedly explored Sothorios with her dragon for three years and never found its southern end, again supposedly. So what in the green hell is going on here? Well as usual I think the better question is what happened here? because doesn't seem to have always been like this, at least not this bad. And I do think the evidence suggests, as usual, uh, lost layers of civilization, that's right. So what I have for you today are two separate theories about two separate human populations that I believe used to exist on Sothorios. One linked to the Summer Islanders, and on the other end of the spectrum, one linked to the Squishers. Plus I've got a bonus theory, b, -b bonus theory! about the origins of the b, b brindled men. Sorry, I'll stop doing that. The brindled men. I've talked about some of these ideas in brief before, but never in detail. So let me tell you what happened to Sothorios and the people who used to call it home. Ooh, Dave, this sounds interesting. Dude, Rhaegar, hang on a second, I'm recording. I want to know about those velociraptors. Yeah, yeah, everyone wants to know about the velociraptors. They're velociraptors. Oh, uh, do you think George is having trouble finishing wins because he's trying to fit in more scenes with velociraptors? No, probably not. I think it's just genuinely a challenge to write a giant epic fantasy novel with tons of characters and interwoven plot lines. Well, I suppose you're right, Dave, and that's why I love the fact that we're sponsored by World Anvil, the ultimate all-in-one software for tabletop gamers and fantasy science fiction authors. I bet a lot of your viewers are either gamers or writers, and World Anvil could really prevent them from struggling for years to, you know. Hey, easy there. Easy. And did you say all-in-one software? That's right, Dave, because World Anvil's not just one tool. It's three complete creative tool sets. A world-building suite, an RPG campaign manager, and a novel writing and publishing tool. Yeah, and the distraction-free writing tool is great for those of us who are... You know. Hey, what if I wrote my own fantasy novel about a handsome prince whom everyone thought was dead, but whom in actuality was living on a strange jungle continent hunting velociraptors? Sounds like Rhaegar Dinosaur Hunter to me. And then I can even share my story and collaborate with over two million other storytellers right on the World Anvil platform. Hell yeah, Rhaegar, go for it. I bet tons of people will be mad for... Velociraptor-centered fantasy fiction. And remember, folks, if you try World Anvil today and use the promo code DAVID, you'll get 51% off any premium subscription. And now let's talk about, well, you know. Is it the Velociraptors? That's right. Sothorios Horror Zoo. That's right, that's the best title I could come up with. That's kind of what's going on here. So let's go over the basic horrific details and then we'll talk about its history and its secret prehistory. I'll pull up these quotes from the maesters of the world of ice and fire, and uh, we'll go over the highlights, if you will. 
Now, some of this is fairly normal for people from a northern climate visiting a tropical jungle. There will be little to no developed resistance or immunity to local viruses and diseases, and a general lack of knowledge of how best to treat such conditions or how best to avoid them. This does sound like a particularly bad batch of plagues, though, with names like blood boils, green fever, sweet rot, bronze pate, the red death, grayscale, brown leg, worm bone, sailor's bane, pus eye, yellow gum. Some of these might have real world analogs, but we know grayscale is a magical disease. What's bronze pate? Ugh. So, again, some of these may have real world analogs, but some of these names are. Probably just meant to lead our imagination down dark corridors and then abandon us to the wolves of the mind. That's right. Now, this next bit is a real delight. Not just crocodiles, but boat flipping crocodiles. Said those are the worst kind. The boats must look like flimsy and bountiful pinatas to the crocodiles from under the water, I imagine. Swarms of piranha might not be fantastical, but they are certainly dangerous. And you imagine the Sothorios piranha are, I don't know, extra aggressive or large or something. Stinging flies, venomous snakes, wasps and worms that lay their eggs beneath the skin of animals and humans alike. Well, those are actually nothing fantastic. Fantastical either, just nasty. But the same can't be said for basilisks. Those are fantastical and nasty. A Song of Ice and Fire basilisks are apparently some sort of undescribed and highly venomous lizard, which can be found in the jungles of Yeeti and Sothorios. But the ones in Sothorios are especially big, sometimes growing to be twice the size of lions. Any sort of highly venomous fighting lizard the size of a small car would actually be an underrated problem for any would-be settlers. These must certainly be apex predators, and that's probably why they've apparently taken over an entire peninsula called Basilisk Point. And they were once numerous on the Basilisk Isles, as one might guess from its name. Giant apes are an interesting one, if only because the somewhat nearby Isle of Lang in the Jade Sea also has giant apes, and smart apes as well. Spotted humpback apes said to be almost as clever as men, and hooded apes as large as giants. So strong they can pull the arms and legs off a man as easily as a boy might pull the wings off a fly. Seems like the giant, super strong apes in these two locations are probably related species or even the same species. And that fits with the basilisks being found in both Yeeti and Sothorios. These two areas share a similar latitude, climate, and topography. And you can even imagine that Sothorios may have once been joined to Essos here at the islands of Greater and Lesser Morak, which look like a continuation of the Bones mountain range as it runs south into the Summer Sea. This would have been thousands and even millions of years ago in all likelihood. But it does make sense to find related species of animals spread from E.T. to Sothorios. Now, it's a little more mysterious that lemurs are primarily native to Sothorios and the Summer Isles, which are unlikely to have ever been connected, but we'll get to that. First, we have to talk about the animals that everyone clicked on this video to hear about, the raptors and the wyverns. Farther south lie the regions known as the Green Hell, where beasts even more fearsome are said to dwell. There, if the tales are to be trusted, are caverns full of pale white vampire bats who drain the blood from a man in minutes. Tattooed lizards stalk the jungles, running down their prey and ripping them apart with long curved claws on their powerful hind legs. Snakes 50 feet long slither through the underbrush, and spotted spiders weave their webs amongst the great trees. All right, well, for all we know, the spotted spiders are the most dangerous of the bunch. It's usually the tiniest ones that are the worst, but those are the apparent velociraptors there. The tattooed lizards with the scythe claws that run you down in the jungle. And I'm really not sure what those could be other than velociraptors, so there you go. And I looked it up. The longest anaconda ever recorded is 33 feet long, despite the movie. So 50-foot-long snakes are potentially just... Bigger and meaner fantasy world anacondas, I'm thinking. The same is probably true for the giant vampire bats that drain the blood from a man in seconds. And if you'll remember, there are skeletons of giant bats hanging in Blood Raven's cave. So those definitely do exist in this world. I'm not sure if they ever once existed. I didn't look this up, you know, millions of years ago or something. But yeah, giant vampire bats, apparently. So however you slice it, they don't call it the green hell for nothing. It's quite dangerous. And then we have the wyverns. Most terrible of all are the wyverns, those tyrants of the southern skies, with their great leathery wings, cruel beaks, and insatiable hunger. Close kin to dragons, wyverns cannot breathe fire, but they exceed their cousins in ferocity and are a match for them in all other respects save size. 
Brindled wyverns with their distinctive jade and white scales grow up to 30 feet long. Swamp wyverns have been known to attain even greater size, though they are sluggish by nature and seldom fly far from their lairs. Brown bellies, no larger than monkeys, are even more dangerous than their larger kin, for they hunt in packs of a hundred or more. But most dreaded of all is the Shadow Wing, a nocturnal monster whose black scales and wings make him all but invisible until he descends out of the darkness to tear apart his prey. To me, the brown bellies sound the worst. I mean, I can't even imagine that. It sounds like a cross between rabid flying monkey men and the compsognathuses that ate the park owner at the end of Jurassic Park. At least in the book version. I can't really remember what happens in the movie version, but the brown bellies don't sound fun. Packs of a hundred or more. No, thank you. The wyverns don't breathe fire, so huh, that's a relief. At least we know we'll get chewed and torn apart to death instead of roasted. That's... A comfort, I guess. And oh look, they're insatiable and more aggressive than dragons. That's nice. And the largest one is invisible. So don't go there. That, that seems to be the first takeaway of our exploration of the flora and fauna of Sothorios. This is some sort of fantasy world jungle continent, but it seems like there's a kind of runaway evolution going on here, where the harsh environment is serving as a crucible to forge the most dangerous beastie. No wonder hardly anyone lives there. However, it wasn't always the case, so let's move on to the next section and talk about the history of Sothorios. All right, so the earliest recorded history of human contact with Sothorios comes from the Giscari. We'll get into the secret prehistory stuff in a minute, have no fear, but the official history of recorded contact with record-keeping civilizations, if you will, began with outposts of the slave empire of Old Gis on the northern coast of the continent. Wonderful places such as Zamatar, near the mouth of the sluggish green river Zamoyos. Gorgai, on the Isle of Tears, later renamed Gagasos. We'll talk about that place in a second. And the quote-unquote grim penal colony Gorosh on Wyvern Point. One suspects the idea there was that the prisoners wouldn't even try to escape, lest they be eaten by all the insatiably hungry and hyper-aggressive wyverns. Zamatar, it says, lasted only a generation, and many centuries later, Nymeria and her refugee Roinar briefly settled in the ruins of Zamatar before moving on to the Summer Islands, and then finally Westeros. We're also told that Carthine adventurers sought for gold, gems, and ivory on the east coast, and that Summer Islander adventurers did the same on the west. But the other major human presence on Sothorios, apart from the Giscari at this time, was that of Valeria. The Valerians were there, seemingly because they were in competition with the Giscari, and it says that... The freehold of Valeria thrice established colonies on Basilisk Point. The first was destroyed by the brindled men, the second lost to plague, and the third was abandoned when the dragon lords captured Zamatar in the Fourth Giscari War. So the Valyrian presence on Sothorios is interesting for a couple of reasons, especially for those of you who think that the origin of dragons lies in some sort of magical crossbreeding between wyverns, such as are found on Sothorios, and fireworms, which of course are found in the volcanic mountains of the Valyrian Peninsula. We've never heard of wyverns in Valeria, so in order for this theory to have traction, we'd need a clue about Valerians being in proximity to wyverns, and... Although they're here on Basilisk Point and not Wyvern Point, they're at least on the right continent. A modified version of this theory, which I actually prefer, is that it was the Great Empire of the Dawn who created dragons from crossbreeding wyverns and fireworms. And the reason I like that theory better, of course, is because the evidence about the Great Empire of the Dawn, which I believe is just the name of this ancient Ashai empire, indicates that they already possessed the magical art of controlling dragons and building out a few stone. So I feel like if anyone created dragons, then it would have been the Great Empire of the Dawn who existed before Valyria. But of course, it could also be that on a magical world like the Planetos, Dragons are naturally occurring creatures, even though they are magical. Now, the most famous or infamous Valerian colony on Sothorios started off as a Giscari colony, and that's the one called Gorgai slash Gogossos. I'm just going to read this because it's too horrible to summarize. The largest of the basilisks is the Isle of Tears, where steep-sided valleys and black bogs hide amongst rugged flint hills and twisted windswept rocks. On its southern coasts stand the broken ruins of a city founded by the old empire of Gis, 
It was known as Gorgai for close on two centuries, or perhaps four, there is some dispute, until the Dragon Lords of Valyria captured it during the Third Giscari War and renamed it Gogossos. By any name, it was an evil place. The Dragon Lords sent their worst criminals to the Isle of Tears to live out their lives in hard labor. In the dungeons of Gagasos, torturers devised new torments. In the flesh pits, blood sorcery of the darkest sort was practiced, as beasts were mated to slave women to bring forth twisted half-human children. Well, that's certainly an evil place. I don't know what flesh pits are. Apparently that's what they are. That's what they do there. So, yeah, and it actually gets worse later in history, if you can believe that. But don't miss what appears to be another clue about potential magical crossbreeding to create dragons, or perhaps even blood of the dragon people, which would be that the Valerians were using blood magic to crossbreed humans and animals. As to the it gets worse part, well, how about an intimate description of one of those nasty diseases we talked about at the beginning of the video? The infamy of Gogossos outlived even the doom. During the Century of Blood, this dark city waxed rich and powerful. Some called her the Tenth Free City, but her wealth was built on slaves and sorcery. Her slave markets became as notorious as those of the old Giscari cities on Slaver's Bay. Seven and seventy years after the Doom of Valyria, however, it is said that their stink reached even the nostrils of the gods, and a terrible plague emerged from the slave pens of Gagasos. The Red Death swept across the Isle of Tears, then the rest of the Basilisk Isles. Nine men of every ten died screaming, bleeding copiously from every orifice, their skin shredding like wet parchment. Well, I'm not sure what's worse, the way that those people died or the fact that Gagasos was apparently active for 5,000 years. That's what's implied. The Valerians seized it in the Third Giscari War, and the Fifth Giscari War is thought to have occurred around 5,000 years ago. And Gagasos was apparently still active after the Doom, which was only 400 years ago. So that's, that's a long time to be running a horrific human experiment, slave camp, flesh pit place. Yee. Now, just clear, clear the slate for a minute. Setting aside the horrors of Valerian sorcery and slavery, there is also that Valerian dragon lord who explored Sothorios with her dragon. Her name was Genera Belaris, and she supposedly flew her dragon Terax farther south than any man or woman had ever gone before, seeking the boiling seas and steaming rivers of legend, but found only endless jungles, deserts, and mountains. She returned the freehold after three years to declare that Sothorios was as large as Essos, a land without end. So this is interesting, but it may also be bullshit. That's right. The more I think about this, the fishier it sounds. I mean, it would only take a couple of weeks to fly a dragon across any continent. So the idea that she never found the southern end in three years just doesn't pass the smell test. Like I said, very fishy. Also, a single dragon lord survived alone in this hellscape for three years. What did she and her dragon eat? And where did they find safe sources of drinkable water? How did she sleep safely on the ground at night with no one else to stand watch? How did they avoid all the diseases and parasites? How were they never attacked by a pack of vicious brown bellies or one of those huge shadow wings? Three whole years just sort of flying around Sothorios. Of course, we can never know exactly what she found, but the obvious answer to how did she survive so long is that she found a civilization of some kind and stayed with them for most of that time. The Valerians, or perhaps Genera herself, must have decided to keep it secret. And then, as a cover story, offered up this crap about how Sothorios is a land without end, which, by the way, is very dangerous, and there's no reason for anyone to ever go there. Either it's that, some kind of secret, or Martin just sort of wrote this three-sentence story in the world of ice and fire without really thinking it through very deeply. And that's usually not the answer to mysteries in A Song of Ice and Fire. No, I'm not saying that George has already, you know, detailed out in his mind some secret civilization that's completely off the map that's going to show up at the last battle. Looking at you, Robert Jordan. But it would be weird to think that there are no people and no civilizations anywhere in the Southern Hemisphere. And a Valerian flying a dragon to explore would be just the kind of person to be able to fly further than anyone else and discover such a civilization, even if they were hidden in the jungle or in the mountains. Leave a comment below and let me know what you think about this. Am I just getting carried away, or is this a discreet little mystery here? 
I regret saying that already. Welcome to 10,000 comments about how I'm getting carried away. I get those anyway. And then after that, the only real recorded human interaction with Sothorios would be Nymeria's stop over here, which I alluded to earlier. That boils down to the Roinar having fled Valeria and ended up in Sothorios, where they had a bad time for about two years and then left. The highlight, or low light, was an incident where uh, the colony at Yin was simply not there anymore when the Zamatar Roinar came to visit one day. This definitely seems inspired by the story of the North American lost colony of Roanoke, which is a pretty cool story to look up if you like stories about people who vanished without a trace. This is one of the best ones. All right, secret prehistory time. Yes, time to talk about ye and the ruin older than time. I think I've read this quote at least five or six times in videos before. And the video you want to watch with this one is definitely the Moat Kalen video, because Moat Kalen is really the key to unlocking the mystery of Yin. As I said, the Maesters call it a ruin older than time, which implies that neither the Valerians nor the Giscari built it, because we have record of all of their cities and settlements on Sothorios. And I myself have long marveled at the very interesting fact that the build style, the megalithic build style of Yin seems to match Moat Kalen almost exactly. So at Yin, they speak of oily black stone blocks so big they'd require a dozen elephants to move. While Moat Kalen's 20 towers and 80 foot high curtain wall were originally constructed entirely of immense blocks of black basalt as large as a crofter's cottage, which Theon imagines must once have taken a hundred men to hoist them into place. So a hundred men, a dozen elephants, their huge black megaliths, and when Theon observes the basalt blocks of Moat Kalen damp after the rain, it says that morning sunlight made them look as if they were coated in some fine black oil. That suggests that oily black stone may be a magically transformed version of black basalt, at least here at Moat Kalen, if not everywhere else. Which I think makes a lot of sense, but check out the Moat Kalen video for the full analysis and all the clues. My conclusion from all that was that Moat Kalen absolutely, definitely, 100% was built by the Deep Ones and their hybrid thralls. I mean, the symbolism, the Lovecraftian literary parallels, and the raw forensic clues seem to all point in that direction. And that means that a prime suspect for the builders of Yin would be the Deep Ones and their hybrid thralls. And it just so happens that there are fishy people living right in the neighborhood, and they also have oily black stone. And of course, I'm talking about those toad people from the Isle of Toads and their oily black stone toad idol. This is another quote that I've read in the Moat Kalen and Deep Ones videos and a few other places. And as we know, these fishy people are far from the sole surviving population of humanoids who were hybridized by the Deep Ones in the past. They do, however, seem to be the last remnant of a larger population of fish people that existed here on Sothorios before the Giscari or Valerians ever came. Elsewhere in the world of Ice and Fire, the Maesters tell us that ruins found upon the Isle of Tears, the Isle of Toads, and Axe Island hint at some ancient civilization, but little is now known of these vanished men of the Dawn Age. If any still survived when the first Corsairs settled on the islands, they were soon put to the sword, so no trace of them now remains, save perhaps upon the Isle of Toads. And of course, those sole survivors from this ancient civilization that they're talking about are those fishy people on the Isle of Toads. So, just how large was this civilization of the Toad people? Perhaps large enough to encompass Yin, where we find more oily black stone, and a fortress which I'm suggesting was built by a fishy Deep One hybrid people? Well, first of all, note that the Maesters mention ruins on Axe Island, as well as the Isle of Toads and other Basilisk Isles. Because Axe Island is pretty far away, as you can see here on the map. So that's already a pretty large territory that the fishy people are controlling. Yin could absolutely be included within their territory. And then there's this other clue I found about just what kind of stone these fishy people were using to build these other places on the Basilisk Isles, which are now in ruins. In a brief note about the history of the Basilisk Isles and their Corsairs, it says that the Carthian pirate Zendaro Zor was the first to raise his banner there, using the stones he found on Axe Isle to erect a grim black fort above his anchorage. So we can't know if these are oily black stones, such as we find at Yin in the Isle of Toads. However, it certainly seems possible. I mean, if there's a 40-foot-high oily black stone 
boulder, basically, on the Isle of Toads, and enough oily black stone for the builders of Yin to carve a bunch of cottage-sized megaliths and then make a fortress with the stuff, it makes sense that there is, or was, some repository or even quarry of oily black stone somewhere in the area, somewhere between Yin and the Isle of Toads. Ergo, I think the best fitting together of the pieces here implies a Deep One civilization, which built Yin, carved the Toad Idol, and built these other cities or fortresses on the other Basilisk Isles. It's also said that the jungle hides other ruins and ruined cities, so we actually have no way of knowing how far this civilization of the toad people might have spread. But it does seem fairly sizable. As to what humans went into this hybrid population of fish people, well, we have no way of knowing, of course, but I have four guesses. It could have started with a few lost fishermen from Gis, since Gis was the first to settle Sothorios. It could have been some Dawn Age SOC canoe-goers, sort of island-hopping from the area of Karth across the Morak Islands. It could have been the ancestors of the Brindled Men, of course, who seemed to be native to Sothorios. Or perhaps it could have even been some lost colonists from the Great Empire of the Dawn who were hybridized, if indeed they came here to breed wyverns or whatever. It's probably an unanswerable question, but those are my best guesses. And of course, Leave a comment and let me know what you think. Now let's talk brindled men and conspiracy. All right, so before I read to you this maesterly description of the brindled men, who again are native to Sothorios, I want to specify that these are in fact some sort of differently evolved humanoid and not just a figment of the maester's imagination slash xenophobia. The Sothori, as they are called, cannot successfully produce offspring with humans, which means they've evolved a pretty long way away from humans, considering that in A Song of Ice and Fire, humans can produce offspring with children of the forest, giants, deep ones, and who knows what else. And that's without the sort of Valyrian magical crossbreeding. You can just have a child of the forest or deep one wife or husband and have babies. So that means these brindled men are very distant cousins, if they are cousins at all. The Sothori are big-boned creatures, massively muscled, with long arms, sloped foreheads, huge square teeth, heavy jaws, and coarse black hair. Their broad, flat noses suggest snouts, and their thick skins are brindled in patterns of brown and white that seem more hog-like than human. Sothori women cannot breed with any save their own males. When mated with men from Essos or Westeros, they bring forth only stillbirths, many hideously malformed. The Sothori that dwell closest to the sea have learned to speak the trade talk. The Giscari consider them too slow of wit to make good slaves, but they are fierce fighters. Farther south, the trappings of civilization fall away, and the brindled men become ever more savage and barbaric. These Sothori worship dark gods with obscene rites. Many are cannibals, and more are ghouls. When they cannot feast upon the flesh of foes and strangers, they eat their own dead. All right, so are they cannibals? Do they eat the dead? Are their teeth really large and square? Well, probably to that last, and perhaps to the other questions. But it's really neither here nor there, unless you're thinking of hiring a brindled man as your chef. Which it sounds like you probably shouldn't do. But in terms of physical appearance, what's interesting is that these brindled men sound almost exactly like the Ibanese from the island of Ib in the Shivering Sea. So as you can see here from the quote up on the screen, the Ibanese are a race of almost Neanderthal-like hairy men who can only barely interbreed with humans. Their men can impregnate human women successfully, though the offspring are said to be sterile, similar to the way a mule is the sterile offspring of a horse and a donkey. Like the brindled men, these Ibanese are also broad-shouldered, thickly muscled, long-armed, and ferociously strong, and they are similarly described as having sloped brow ridges, massive jaws, big square teeth, and coarse black hair, as it says elsewhere. So they really are quite similar, and the Ibanese are known to have descended from a now extinct older race of humanoids called the Hairy Men, who are potentially even more Neanderthal-like. And then just to complete the family picture, we have the hairier-than-most 
people of Skagos in northern Westeros, who are thought to have either some distant Ibanese ancestry or possibly giant ancestry. So here's what I think is going on. If the Skagosi are descended from the Ibanese, and remember that the Ibanese are very skilled mariners who are more than capable of reaching Skagos, and Skagos, of course, is an island on a similar latitude to the island of Ib with a similar climate. So if the Skagosi are partially descended from Ibanese, then that means some amount of successful interbreeding between the Ibanese and humans is possible, meaning it's possible to produce offspring that aren't sterile, because otherwise, how would they pass on the Ibanese blood to future generations of Skagosi, obviously? And if the Ibanese are smaller and potentially more human-like versions of their ancestors, the larger hairy men, then that could imply that the hairy men interbred with humans in the past to create the Ibanese. So, as you may have guessed, it seems like Martin is mimicking our own human history, where we have cousin species of humanoids, the Neanderthals, the Denisovans, the, the Java Hobbit Man, which makes me think of the little dwarf at the House of the Undying, you know? So these hairy men and their Ibanese descendants seem like dead ringers for Neanderthals, right? And the Ibanese in particular seem like a thought experiment where Martin said, what if some smart Neanderthals survived into modern times and built a civilization? Humans in many parts of the world, of course, did interbreed with Neanderthals, despite our last common ancestor having existed approximately 650,000 years ago or more. And humans have interbred with Denisovans as well, and Neanderthals with Denisovans, and there might be one or two other lost populations. So I think that's more or less what George is going for here. Since the Ibanese and the Brindled Men sound so similar physically, and since we know the brindled men are at least clever enough to learn language, if not to build ships like the Ibanese, I suspect that this older hairy man race may be a common ancestor of the Ibanese and the brindled men. Or maybe that the hairy men are simply closer to the last common ancestor between them and the brindled men, something like that. Neanderthals and Denisovans, of course, did spread out from Africa hundreds and thousands of years before humans did. So it makes a lot of sense to suppose that George might be imagining brindled men and hairy men as you know, another of his older races that inhabited the world before humans, along with the giants and the children of the forest and the deep ones and whatever else. In particular, these taller, extinct hairy men and the large brindled men seem like they're just more closely related on the evolutionary tree to giants, such as the giants we see uh, north of the wall in Westeros, which are, you know, again, about 14 feet tall, very hairy and with sloped brow ridges and square teeth and all that kind of stuff. Perhaps the giants even evolved from the hairy men. That's probably a pretty good guess. Now, the brindled men, of course, have this brindled skin thing going on, these alternating patches of light and dark pigment, which somewhat insultingly reminds the maesters of the skin of a pig or perhaps a cow. Now, I don't think these are likely to be some sort of pig people. Pig man, pig man. Ha ha, no, probably not. That seems kind of weird. But I do have a guess as to what this detail means. So remember the extra large and super strong apes that are found on Sothorios? Larger than giants, who are, again, about 14 feet tall. Well, those giant apes aren't spotted, which is similar to Brindled. However, some of their Langi cousins are. As we saw earlier on Lang, it is said that they have both hooded apes as large as giants, so strong they can pull the arms and legs off a man, which sound a lot like the giant, super strong Sothorios apes. But then they also have spotted humpback apes said to be almost as clever as men. Now, since humans evolved from apes in the real world, <laughs> there goes the young earth creationist crowd. Say la vie. We should suppose that it's probably the same here, unless otherwise indicated. And in that context, these super smart spotted apes are kind of interesting. Are they perhaps closer to the last common ancestor between humans and ape kind in A Song of Ice and Fire? Did the spotted apes evolve into brindled men? This is certainly the event horizon of the Song of Ice and Fire speculation, but I did want to bring you here and ask the question, so let me know what you think in the comments. Now, I do actually have a more evidence-based theory about people who used to live on Sothorio, so let's go on to the next section, and I'll tell you about how the Summer Islands are tied into all of this. All right, so finally the maesters tell us concerning Sothorios that... Some say there were other races here once, forgotten peoples, destroyed, devoured, or driven out by the brindled men. 
Tales of lizard men, lost cities, and eyeless cave dwellers are commonplace. No proof exists for any of these. All right, well, I think I can explain all of this. So the lizard men are probably just runaway Valerian experiments from Gogasos. That's easy. And the eyeless cave dwellers probably are too, given that some of the Targaryen lizard babies are eyeless. I think Magor had one of those. And by the way, do check out the Disputed Lands videos called The Secret Origin of Dragons Part 1 and 2. And then watch my Dracomorph video, which builds on Amanda's two videos there. That is, if you want more on lizard humans, freaky blood magic, parasites, Gagasos, the Red Death, the Dragon Bond, and how all of this is similar to uh, the Chestbursters from Aliens. And you can find the links to those videos in the description below. So setting aside lizard people and eyeless cave dwellers, notice the line about forgotten peoples driven out by the brindled men, who apparently aren't the nicest neighbors. I mean, they may have driven the Deep One hybrids out of Yeen, so that's... It must be pretty ferocious. But what about other human inhabitants being driven out of Sothorios in the very, very ancient past? Could that have happened? Well, yes. Yes, I, th I think it did. And I think there are clues that the Summer Islanders were those people. Such as the line where the maesters say, only a few days sail south of Basilisk Point. Even the shape of its coasts remains unknown. It may be that the Summer Islanders have explored and mapped these shorelines, but they guard their charts jealously and do not share such knowledge. Secret maps of Sothorio say, very interesting, very interesting. Those are mentioned again in the section about the Summer Islanders themselves, where it says, Bold mariners, their captains scorn to hug the coast like other seafarers, but instead strike out fearlessly across the ocean deeps, far from the sight of land. There are certain indications that explorers from Koj may well have mapped the western coast of Sothorios to the very bottom of the world and discovered strange lands and stranger peoples far to the south or across the endless waters of the Sunset Sea. But the truth of these tales is known only to the princes of the isles and the captains who serve them. So they've got a very secretive culture, they're very skilled mariners, and there are certain indications that they have found other civilizations and the end of Sothorios. And again, we think of Genera Bellaris, and perhaps this is the reason why that little story is in here, to help us put together this mystery. So here's the thing about people living on an island in the middle of the ocean. We can assume that at some point in the past, their ancestors sailed and migrated to those islands. In our own world, humans evolved in one place, Africa, and then gradually spread out across the world from there. And as humanity did fan out across the globe, the last places that we reached were islands like New Zealand and the Pacific Islands, including the Hawaiian Islands, which are probably one of the things most similar to the Summer Isles. To me, they seem like kind of a cross between the Caribbean islands, Hawaii, and of course, Africa. Now, the maritime navigation skill of the Pacific Islander people who discovered Hawaii and those other islands is of course legendary. And we should suppose that the Summer Isles, which are quite remote, would have been originally settled by a culture similarly skilled in seafaring and navigation. The Summer Islanders are, to this day, the most skilled ocean-going seafarers, and they have also become the best craftsmen of large ships, so you can kind of see where this is going. They must have come from somewhere else, and they must have already possessed some level of advanced navigational skill in order to find the Summer Islands in the first place and then make repeated trips to migrate and establish a population there. So, where did they come from? Was it Sothorios? Well, let's take a look at the history of the Summer Islanders. Their earliest maps, as carved into the famous Talking Trees of Tall Trees Town, show no lands but the isles themselves, surrounded by a vast, world-spanning ocean. As islanders, they took to the seas in the dawn of days, first in oared coracles, then in larger, swifter ships with sails of woven hemp. Yet few ever ventured beyond the sight of their own shores, and those who sailed beyond the horizons did not always return. Lomas Longstrider, who visited the Summer Isles in his search for wonders, recorded that the sages of the Isles claimed that their ancestors once reached the western shores of Sothorios and founded cities there, only to have them overwhelmed and destroyed by the same forces that wiped out later Giscari and Valerian settlements on that perilous continent. The Citadel's archives hold a few ancient chronicles of Valeria, but none speak of these supposed cities, and there are maesters who cast doubts on the truth of these claims. 
The first recorded contact between the Summer Isles and the wider world occurred at the height of the old empire of Gis. So first of all, this gives us an approximate minimum date for the first contact between the Summer Isles and Gis of at least five to 6,000 years ago. Meanwhile, Lomas Longstrider says that the sages of the Summer Islanders claim that they founded cities on Sothorios before Valeria and Gis ever arrived, which would be older than this first contact because these Summer Islander cities seem to have disappeared before the Valerians and the Giscari began settling Sothorios. As the Valerian histories don't speak of any Summer Islander cities, and the Giscari remember their first contact as being when a Giscari sailor uh, got blown offshore and accidentally discovered the Summer Isles. So if there is any truth to this tale of Summer Islander cities on Sothorios, it's very, very old indeed. So to me, the truth is obvious. The Summer Islanders didn't found cities on Sothorios, they are from those cities on Sothorios. That is their home. And again, you have to migrate from somewhere to get to islands. So these summer islanders had to have come from somewhere, and Sothorios is right there, and we have these tales of these very old cities. These legends are so freaking old that they predate contact with the rest of the known world, and they predate Valerian and Giscari presence on Sothorios. And the fact that they're called cities and not settlements or towns or colonies, well, this just seems like a fog of history thing. And that over time, the legends of the Summer Islanders came to kind of reverse the order of causality to these events, saying that people from the Summer Isles had gone over to Sothorios and built cities which were overrun by the brindled men, when in actuality the Summer Islanders originally came from cities on Sothorios which were overrun by the brindled men. Now as to those ancient maps which appear to show the Summer Isles alone in a world ocean, well, I suspect that those may have been a kind of propaganda belief which arose to dissuade people from trying to sail back to their home, which some people would have tried to do. Nymeria specifically burned all of the Roinar ships to sort of drive out the thought of ever returning home for all of her Roinar, because it just wouldn't have been safe to do so. I mean, the home of the Roinar was overrun by monstrous lizards and hybrid lizard people, just like Sothorios was. So we can assume that this also would have been an issue for the Summer Islanders who first migrated there, they would have needed to do something to break that idea of returning home, and maybe they began to say that these islands were the only islands that existed. Or it could be that those are just sacred maps that are only meant to depict the Summer Isles, and they're not meant to be comprehensive world maps. Or maybe they're, you know, they're, they're on trees and there's only so much room on the bark. Besides, if you think about it, the fact that the sages of the Summer Islanders say that they went to Sothorios and founded cities in the Dawn Age means that the Summer Islanders themselves, at least the sages, know and believe that they have always known of other lands. The fact that they have these secret maps that they won't show anyone implies that there could be some valuable secret to their knowledge of lands to the south and the west. And these older stories of Summer Islander adventurers searching for gold and other things on the west coast imply the same thing. Or perhaps those were incidents of Summer Islanders trying to sail back to their homeland, which didn't go so well, and which the sages were trying to discourage with their maps of just the Summer Isles. Whatever knowledge these Summer Islander adventurers who came to Sothorios had of Sothorios probably came from their original connection to that land. They surely would have some ancient legends from that time, and those legends would no doubt speak of lost riches, lost cities, lost shrines, other civilizations, that sort of thing. So other inhabitants of Sothorios may have fled elsewhere to lands south and west and off the map, but I think that some of them did flee to the Summer Isles and become the Summer Islanders. They must have taken advantage of their Dawn Age maritime skill and probably coracles and such to find and settle what must have seemed like basically the opposite of Sothorios, right? Parrots and flowers and golden wood trees that are the best in the world for making ships and bows out of. And hemp, too. They have hemp sails, so keep it chill out there. Praise Garth. They must have brought the lemurs with them, as I mentioned earlier, since lemurs are primarily found in Sothorios and the Summer Isles, and they probably didn't swim there on their own. Also, notice that the Summer Islands are probably bigger than you think. They're a lot bigger than the Hawaiian Islands, actually, even though it's a similar layout. It's more comparable in size to the Valerian Peninsula. So please don't imagine an entire continent's worth of people 
fleeing and then ending up on a tiny little island chain. They're not tiny, they're just far away. So yes, not only did Nymerius Exodus of the Roinar pass through Sothorios and then the Summer Islands before finally arriving and ending in Dorne, it may be that they were in part following the path of a much older population exodus, one that moved similarly from Sothorios to the Summer Islands. Now, the other historical parallel that leaps to mind as a possible parallel is the uncloaking of Bravos. When Bravos revealed its existence to the world after a hundred years of hiding in the fog, Bravos was founded by a group of escaped Valerian slaves, which is why they hid their location. And it just so happens that these slaves were on the way to Sothorios when they took over their ship and broke free of bondage, and then sailed north and founded Bravos, obviously. That's why I say this could be an intentional parallel from the author, since we have people fleeing Sothorios, and again, lizards and lizard people in the Valerians, in order to build a new home in a secret location. And Bravos technically is also a, a bunch of little islands, too. It's not an island chain far out on the ocean, but it is it is a kind of little mini island chain. In any case, let me know what you think about the Summer Islander Theory, which is a David Lightbringer original. I've had that one for years, actually, in the hopper. I've never heard anyone else propose that. So let me know. I'm definitely curious to see what you guys think of all these ideas. They're pretty speculative, but pretty fun. And I actually dropped some teasers for this essay in the Discord a couple weeks ago. So... If you want to get in on the Discord and support the program, then simply check out the Patreon link below or look for the Join button below next to the Subscribed button. I call it the Subscribed button because doubtless you have already subscribed. So cheers, folks. And in case any of you YouTube channel member squishers or patrons have not heard, I have a cool little Kraken pin to send you. So send me an email at lightbdv at gmail.com. You can see it on your screen and it's in the description below. And I need you to send me your name, your shipping address, and then either your YouTube name or your Patreon name, depending on how you signed up to support the program. So send me that stuff and I will send you a Kraken pin as a thank you. So thank you for watching and I'll see you next time.